Good morning, good morning. Derek Watson, the angry dentist, back again. Wednesday, 15th of March. It's a lovely sunny day. The blackthorn is in flower, which is a bit of a weird thing because it's actually white. And Bitcoin is at $1,250 <clears throat> going up. All is well with the world. Except, except in the National Health Service. <laughs> Which is as barking mad as ever. I've got two stories to tell you. And then I want to talk a bit about orthodontics. Not that I do any, I used to. Not anymore. Not that I don't want to, I just, you know, they just told me I couldn't. Not that I was bad at it, I was good at it. They just told me I couldn't. And I'll tell you why. We had two, two uh, orthodontic stories actually came to light yesterday. One was locally to me in Canterbury. And this was all on the grapevine, so it might be true, it might not, I don't know. But apparently there are three orthodontists in Canterbury and about 30,000 units of orthodontic activity up for grabs. So what does the commissioning authority do under those circumstances? Do they just divide 30 by three and allocate three people 10,000 units each? Oh no. <laughs> do they give their patients choice? Oh no. <laughs> one of the dentists, one of the existing dentists has got about 24,000 of these 30. One has got five and the other one's got about one. Like I say, this is all just gossip, so take it with a pinch of salt. And um, the, lo the commissioning authority only really wants one contract, one contract for 30,000 rather than three. So what they've done is they've invited these three dentists to put in tenders for the 30. The one contract and uh, quite understandably two of them have, I'll leave it up to you to guess which two have decided that uh, they're not gonna bother they're just gonna take early retirement and in fact uh, in, in one case one of them has just decided that he's gonna walk away from everything and not you know as far as we know not make any arrangements for the continuation of the patient's treatment or or anything um, and now I do know that for a fact because uh, we know one of the patients who's um, near completing treatment and has been given no you know just been told to make their own arrangements to finish the treatment off so the other story was also about units of orthodontic activity and it was also about a practitioner who's sort of nearing retirement who decided that uh, he was going to sort of phase out the NHS side of his practice. <clears throat> he does a bit of private ortho as well. But still had some patients on his waiting list. That is, waiting to start treatment, not waiting to be triaged, not even necessarily requiring treatment, but actually just, you know, had, had been referred but hadn't been seen yet, I think. And uh, wrote to, you know, told the commissioning authority that he wanted to, he didn't wish to renew his contract when it expired, because I think, if I remember correctly, the, the orthodontic contracts are, are under the, what they call the personal dental services or something. I think they have a, they have a termination date where, and have to be renewed, whereas the GDS was, the general dental services was different from the PDS in that the, they didn't want to bring in a system of GDS contracts that all had termination dates because you know, every year, one fifth of all the dentists in the country would be would be rolling off their list of providers, and you know they'd have to be negotiating and tendering them all all the time. So, and also the GDS dentists wouldn't really stand for a you know. I mean, it would it substantially increase the risk of having a contract. That's what it's all about. You know, the the risk of uh, putting a termination date in a contract literally massively increases the risk that you might not get the contract when it's comes up for tender and that in turn increases the risk premium on the money that you have to borrow to buy the surgery or run an overdraft or whatever the bank doesn't like 
you know, they, might, they far prefer you to have an open-ended contract. Unusual though that is, uh, but in dentistry it's deemed necessary to uh, provide the service at some sort of reasonable cost. But uh, no, so ortho contracts, he came to the end of his ortho contract and then asked, asked if the, um, they would be, you know, they would consider coming to some arrangement, which he knew that they'd already done for another dentist to extend his contract sufficiently to just triage these last 50 patients and treat them if necessary. And they said no. And he said, look, come on guys, you know, I'm not trying to pull a, a fast one here. I just want to exit neatly, you know, I don't want to let anyone down. Can you just help me out here? They said no. Okay. And this is, you know, this is what I'm talking about, statutory bodies, you know, they're just operate with no concern at all uh, to the human cost of their decisions anyway um, so then what he did was he did something that I I can entirely sympathize with and I'm not at all sure I wouldn't do myself which is he wrote to all these patients and said look um, my funding or no actually no this and he admits this is his only mistake he said that there's no NHS funding for your treatment what he should have said was my funding I, I can't get any funding for your treatment. And then he went. He then went on to offer them the treatment privately, or anyway, he, he did make an offer to, to treat them privately. So, if they wanted to, they wanted that. Otherwise, the alternative was the commissioning authorities' alternative, which is to, uh, you know, take a long walk on a short pier, find another orthodontist, and presumably get on the end of their waiting list all over again. So, uh, anyway, the. The patients, uh, quite understandably, I think, queried this with the commissioning authority and said, look, you know, is this right? This is outrageous. We are, you know, we've been on this waiting list and now we're, we're near the top and now you pull the plug on us. And so the commissioning authority have, have uh, asked him to provide a copy of the letter. And, and he rang to ask us, you know, whether what he should do, you know, should he modify the letter? <laughs> before he sent it to them I said no just send them the letter send it to them you know because uh, they're entitled to see the letter um, well they're not entitled to see the letter to be quite honest but you know I mean what's going to happen if you don't send them the letter you're only going to um, aggravate them and uh, cause the thing to go further so I would just say yeah 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 I did I wrote to them in fact I think he even uh, told them that he was going to write so it can't come as a complete surprise to them that uh, he did right um, and uh, you know the, the problem they're going to have with this letter is one of two th is two things one is one is that uh, it won't be worded in the same way as they would word it and they would word it something along the lines of uh, rest assured that uh, um, you know you'll, you'll still be able to obtain NHS orthodontic treatment just contact any NHS orthodontist or if in doubt ring the commissioning authority and we will find uh, someone's waiting list to put you on um, and the second thing is you know and, and he could have um, I mean I think probably with hindsight if he'd put in a paragraph saying uh, but, but should you wish to um, remain on the NHS which I should imagine probably the majority of them will then he should have just put in a paragraph saying um, you know Here's the number of the local authority. But then, <laughs> having said that, one of them at least found out the number of the local authority and rang it, and uh, and now they're getting an earache from the patients, and they deserve to. Really, they do. They deserve to get earache. The uh, well, let's not try and be too cocky at this roundabout. So, and the second issue is this openness and transparency. You know, the, what he's done is he has spelled out for the patients the, what the decision that the commissioning authority had taken on their behalf without consulting them, without asking them, without even much regard for their welfare or their care. Uh, and he's, he's, he's laid open this decision in a completely transparent way. And that's, I think, what they hate most of all, this commissioning authority. They, they're hating the transparency of it. They do not want daylight on their decisions. They really don't. They, they really, really don't. And 
all, you know, a lot of the trouble I've, uh, a lot of the pushback I've had from uh, commissioning authorities is where the consequences either of their uncaring attitude to the, uh, the, the patients that they're supposed to be looking after or their incompetence has come to light. Um, and I suppose they're thinking, you know, my God, let's hope this doesn't get into the press. And I'm thinking, I hope this does get into the press. <laughs> I, think, I think this deserves to get into the press, what they, you know, how they treat people. How the people are just pawns now, they're just waiting this, you know. It's like playing a game of patience for them. They just turn over another card, they've got, <laughs> they've got like another dentist, they put another dentist here and then they... They put a red seven on a black eight, and then they put a, like a red 10 on a black jack. They, they move these waiting lists here, there, and everywhere. And it's all done in private. They don't like it done in public. This, this comes from Scarborough. This is John Renshaw's territory, where, you know, the, the uh, patients are queuing around the block, and it made headlines, you know, queues for an NHS dentist. And of course, those queues never went away. Those queues are, are, are even larger. I mean, there are thousands of people on a queue to, for an NHS dentist. It's just that uh, they said, look, you know, for God's sake, you, you, you idiots, don't, don't queue outside the front door where everyone can see you. Just bring us and we'll put you on a electronic queue, which is on our computer that only we can see, so nobody knows how much of a queue there is, you know, and then, <laughs> so no more headlines, no more, uh, no more MPs uh, ringing up the Department of Health saying, what's, you know, why have I got, why have I got a queue on the 1st of April for uh, the new financial year on the National Health Service? I mean, <clears throat> orthodontics is, it's a sort of a, I mean obviously it's a branch of dentistry, but it's a, it's a branch that you could live within, you know, I mean you can obviously be a full-time orthodontist. Um, and the history of it all, I mean I'm not talking about the ancient history, but I mean orthodontics as a, as a discipline was practiced by everybody. We were all taught orthodontics and, um, excuse me, the sunlight's going to make me sneeze in a minute, don't watch out. <clears throat> So, um, and, and I, uh, you know, used to do like a dozen ortho cases a year, no trouble at all. And they were all pretty simple. They were all, you know, class two division ones where you took the fours out, retroclined the incisors, or someone had a lateral incisor that was the inside the bite. So you used to prop them open and put a teespring on it and, and stick it over the bite. And that was done fine, but then, what a lot of people don't realise about the 92 contract, the new, the, the new contract, was that the problem was not only that the department felt that the GDS was over, over earning, over performing, over achieving, you know, sucking too much money, uh, but the orthodontists were as well, and they, per, their, their courses of treatment were very expensive, and so when, you know, and they of course found all sorts of little ways to bump themselves up into the next bracket in terms of income per course and so you know they also from just from memory I think the orthodontic budget was about 10% of the total budget and in the bean counters at the Department of Health said no this is no use at all you know we can't we can't be spending 10% of our all of our money on uh, ortho so uh, the decision was made to nobble the orthodontists at the same time as the decision was made to nobble the dentists and the way they nobbled them was that they said, uh, well, for a start, we want to stop everybody doing easy cases. So what we'll do is, you know, and this is a classic sort of micromanagement technique. We'll, we'll have just a few licensed orthodontists, in other words, you know, a few big, a few big orthodontists who we can control. Far fewer orthodontists. And all the orthodontists uh, work needs to go through these orthodontists. So we're not, we're not all watty, doing his 12 cases a year, you can, he can knock that on the head. We'll let the orthodontist do all that. Um, and at the same time, <clears throat> they, so, so they sort of controlled the number of orthodontists and at the same time they considerably raised the bar in terms of the IOTN score required to actually have any orthodontic treatment. So 
and the idea was really sort of to get get a handle on this orthodontic budget. So, um, so you get a situation now where you, you had a sort of consolidation of orthodontic treatment, and then the general practitioners like me, who sort of kept their hand in and who could do the easy cases, were well, then lost the skill. You know, we're sort of. I mean, now I would have to go on a refresher course if I was going to do orthodontist because because. Um, you know, I could probably out push. I could probably do it, but then you know, I don't have a. My technician doesn't do any ortho appliances, so he would have to learn how to wire bend, and uh, you know, it's all you know. They, they they just it's just been phased out of general practice, and you get this ridiculous situation where, um, and the orthodontist, the way it used to work was that because we had like the core skills, we would review the patients, so. When a patient would come in, I don't know, from six years on, as soon as the first molars erupted, we would get them sort of bite together and say, yeah, the first molars are in, in the right relationship or they're not in the right relationship and so they, they look a bit crowded and you give this advice with the checkup to the, to the parents. But, um, and I still do that, you know, I still, I'm still quite happy at the mixed dentition stage to say to the parents, you know, like everything's on track or they look like they, they're gonna be a bit crowded or whatever. And last week, one of the patients said to me, oh, she said, oh, that's interesting because we're gonna see the orthodontist next week. And I'm like, really? I mean, what, how on earth have you ended up seeing an orthodontist? And the answer is that the orthodontist used to um, take the patients on referral. And so in other words, they used to wait for us to say, like this patient has lost all their deciduous teeth or uh, nearly lost them all and therefore is about right for orthodontic treatment but now apparently they, um, they they do all the preliminary stuff as well and I can't see why they're doing it other than um, you know what they, are they providing a, a gratuitous and free monitoring service to the public uh, you know on the off chance in 10 years time they might need to fit a brace I mean I just don't if you're an orthodontist let me know why why are you seeing children that don't need orthodontics? You know, why, why are you sort of uh, triaging the entire population? I honestly don't understand it. Because it's, it, it would be far more efficient if um, if we went back to the old system where the dentist did the easy work and... Uh, I can understand why the orthodontists don't want the dentists to do the easy work because they, they want to do the difficult work and, and they'd like the easy work as well. But, uh, you know, you're an orthodontist, for goodness sake. I mean, you're a specialist. You're, you're not just a specialist. You're a specialist specialist. Uh, you should be doing the bloody tricky stuff. <laughs> the stuff that nobody else can, wants to take on or can understand or, you know, or, or knows how to do. So. so there you go. So that's why orthodontics is sort of still in general practice and, and it's not. And uh, also why... Um, Canterbury you'll you'll only have one orthodontist to go to and everyone will have to go there and whatever he decides is his waiting list will be his waiting list and if he you know and the, the, of course the problem is you get into this sort of vicious circle when you combine NHS with private in the same practice then you get a situation where there's there's a tension set up you know there's a conflict of interest between um, having a short NHS waiting list and not doing any private work and then you get the, the alternative which is having a long NHS waiting list and perhaps doing plenty of private work you know because people are getting squeezed off the NHS list um, and and how do you reconcile that you know do you, the only way you can reconcile that is to forbid NHS practitioners to do any private work but then the Department of Health has gone on record as saying that uh, that's, that's absolutely not their intention, that they they want people to do more NHS work, but they don't, you know, they're not going to restrict their private work. So, anyway. So that's orthodontists. Orthodontics, bit of a mess. Sorry about that. So I'm going to go to work and not do any orthodontics, and I'll see you tomorrow.